You may be wondering, what does copyright and fair use have to do with broccoli? Well, this week, on this week's Wednesday webinar, end of February 2016, I hope to make enough comparisons to convince you that even though it might not be the most enjoyable of topics, it's very good for us all to be informed about copyright and fair use in the realm of education and otherwise. In the next half hour, I hope to take you through a list of definitions, examples, and definitely resources so that we can all feel more safe, secure, and healthy in our use of digital media in education. In order to fully get the best benefits out of this webinar, jot down this one URL, goo.goal slash 6-H-E-P-E-Q. That will give you access to all of the slides as well as the links on them and be a good reminder for on beyond the recording today. First of all, why does copyright even matter? Well, this is definitely becoming more and more evident of a need for us at ESU 8 and beyond. Um, we've heard firsthand stories about rural school districts and other ESUs that have had to deal with lawsuits and pay royalties and fines for things as simple as a teacher posting clip art on their class website. I've heard of another use of a jingle being used in the introduction to a series of math podcasts from a teacher. And when those podcasts were shared on the district's website, they had to deal with a lawsuit because the jingle was not copyright free. We've also heard of another case where a website embedded a, presenta a presentation set of slides from a different presenter. And within those slides was material that infringed upon the rights of what they were able to do. All of these issues really are red flags and alerts to us that we need to be more conscientious of copyright in our daily practices. But how does it apply to me, you may be asking? Why do I need that healthy serving of vegetables and that reminder of copyright and acceptable use? Well, just take a few minutes and sit back and ask yourself if you've ever done any of the following or known someone around you who has. Have you ever searched for an image on Google Image Search and without researching it any further, just took the first image that came up? Have you ever screenshot something? Have you ever used music in a slideshow or a video production? Even music you've purchased, but any kind of music that you didn't create yourself. Have you ever downloaded a video from YouTube? Have you ever added clip art to a classroom newsletter? Have you ever printed and distributed an article, maybe to your students, maybe to fellow colleagues? Have you ever shown a movie in class? Have you ever photocopied sheet music? Or has your school ever hosted a family movie night? Have you ever used things from Teachers Pay Teachers or Pinterest? Just saying you've done any of the following things doesn't necessarily mean you violated copyright, but they're all situations where it's very easy to do so. To understand your rights, your responsibilities, can make you less susceptible to some of this happening. Now, I'm trying to give you legal advice here, but I do uh, want you to all know that I'm not a lawyer. Um, but, but I do can, I can draw from experiences of ESUs around me. Um, we've heard a lot of great information from the Nebraska Department of Education. And we want you to know that this is just the, the beginning. There's much more to come out of ESU 8 to support our educators and our schools in the issue of copyright and fair use. So whether you are a teacher or an administrator, you need to start being diligent about teaching copyright, about modeling it in your own use, and about requiring it from your students or your teachers. These digital citizenship practices are more than important. They are necessary. And it's not just in technology class or in a lesson dealing specifically with media literacy. But this is important in all subject areas, all grade levels, all the time. 
We don't get a freebie exemption just because we're in education. Copyright still matters. So what is copyright? Well, a couple of really prevalent myths are, first of all, um, just because something's on the web, oh, then I can use it. Well, just because it's on the web does not mean that it's copyright free. And another common myth is I bought the rights to listen to that song or I paid for um, the price of that movie on DVD. But just because you have the rights to view it does not mean that others do too. Clearing up those two misconceptions early on for our students and for ourselves can be a good first step into understanding copyright, but really the definition is that it's the rights that any creator has to whatever they created. By the act of creating it, they have rights. If you think of an artist, a photographer, a musician, um, anyone who creates content, they don't have to apply for a patent or apply for a, um, some kind of license that earns them the copyright label. It is just naturally there. I have a short animated video to give us the basics, the copyright and fair use 101 lowdown. So we'll take a look at that now from YouTube. In today's digital world, it's easier than ever to copy, paste, mashup, remix, download, and publish content. People's writing, artwork, videos, and images can be inspiring, but they're also easy to take without thinking twice. When people treat the internet like a free-for-all, legal and ethical situations can arise. That's why it's important to know about copyright and fair use. It will help you give and receive credit where credit is due. So what's a copyright? Copyright law protects your control over the creative work you make. It requires people to get your permission before they copy, rework, or share what you make. Most things that you find, download, and copy and paste from the internet are copyrighted. That doesn't mean that everything online is on lockdown and can't be used. It can, as long as you check who owns it, get permission to use it, give credit to the creator, buy it if necessary, and use it responsibly, then you're not stealing. Now, there are times when you can use a small part of someone else's copyrighted work without permission or paying a fee. This is called fair use. Fair use only applies when using content in certain instances. Schoolwork and education, news reporting, criticizing or commenting, and comedy or parody. Specific guidelines, what we call the four points of fair use, must also be followed. First, you can only use a small amount of the work. Second, you have to add new meaning to the work to make it original. Third, you need to rework it and use it in a totally different way. Finally, you have to use it for nonprofit purposes. In other words, you can't make money off of your new creation. No matter what, it's a good idea to give credit to the creator of the work you used. It's just a sign of respect. So what should you do if you find something online that you want to use? As a rule of thumb, check who owns it, get permission to use it, give credit to the creator, buy it if necessary, and use it responsibly, which means judging for fair use. You're a creator, innovator, and inspirer. Think twice about your rights and responsibilities in our online culture, and then pay it forward. So I want to go a little deeper into two important concepts out of that video. Um, the first is that there are items of creation that are in what is known as the public domain. Um, the public domain is something that's designated as being copyright free. There's no um, reason that attribution is necessary, um, intellectual property rights have expired or have been forfeited or don't apply. Um, for example, Shakespeare, Beethoven early silent films. They've entered the public domain because the copyright term has expired. You can label things 
as public domain and and utilize them without a lot of fear at all, without any fear. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't apply to a lot of the things that we want to use in our classrooms. Um, another term that you'll hear a lot about is Creative Commons. And you may have noticed that even the video we just watched was Creative Commons licensed. That means that the artist or the creator specifically licensed it to be used in a certain way. So you have um, different rights and responsibilities in order to share it forward. Um, all of the licensing in the Creative Commons licensing system, all six of them, include attribution, giving credit to the creator. That's the buy. Different levels of Creative Commons licensing include additional things that you can or can't do with them. For example, if you can or can't sell it, if you need to share it exactly the way that you got it, if there are no derivatives or no um, um, changes to the original form allowed. You can read more about Creative Commons licensing on their website, creativecommons.org. They explain the licensings, the different symbols. They help you put your media on the web with Creative Commons licensing. And later on, we'll find out how to search things that are Creative Commons licensed as well. So knowing those two terms will really help us when we're trying to um, eliminate the fear factor when we're creating things and using things online. Because I know, I kind of sound like I'm scaring everyone into not using digital media at all. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. I firmly believe that we can use it and use it well and use it responsibly and, and not have to worry. So how, what should we do in order to do that? Well, first and foremost, if you or your students are creating a digital project, make your own media. Take out your cell phone, take a picture or a video, um, draw your own drawing. We have the potential to create media um, at our fingertips at most moments in time. We don't need to always go search for it online. Another way that we can um, be less worrisome in the, the licensing and the, the realm of crop copyright is finding the media that is in the public domain, that is license free. Again, even though harder to find and locate, once you do, you can rest assured that you're safe. If you're not able to find it there or make your own, then definitely look for that Creative Commons licensed material. If it's not licensed, then you can still consider using it, but you need to directly find permission from the artist or the creator. Might just take a simple email or a phone call or a little bit of research in order to get that permission. And finally, if it's in the matter of a YouTube video or um, something that's online already and you cannot figure out if you have permission on how to give that credit for the object, just link to it. If it's already on the web, you can provide a hyperlink to it without taking it from their site and putting it on your project. Linking is perfectly legal. When I'm talking with students and teachers, I just ask them to remember two things. Whenever you're using digital media from someone else, give permission and attribution. And it's not one or the other. In other words, just because I have permission doesn't mean that I don't have to give credit or attribution and vice versa. Just because I gave credit doesn't guarantee that I had that ori original permission in the first place. So how do I see if an image has the permission granted for me to use it or not? Let's go visit a popular photo sharing site, Flickr. This is a great repository for finding images. When you visit Flickr, you can of course search for images in the search bar. I'll just search for photos of an iPad. And um, you can immediately click on any of those images, but we, we're not sure if we have the copyright permissions to reuse it or not. So if you do select an image, you'll notice in the bottom right hand corner that it says some rights reserved. If you click on that, then you can see what the artist designated 
as being the criteria for sharing this image or using this image. If you click on it, it'll give you more details. In this particular image, you're free to share and adapt it. You can transform it, build upon it to your heart's desire. Um, you just have to give attribution. You just have to provide appropriate credit. That is one image of an iPad. You'll notice another here. Um, we just look at another image here and just take a look at, again, all rights are reserved on this one. So the artist posted this photo on Flickr, but we have no right to use it, not even giving credit. Okay, this is saying that they're reserving all rights and we, have, we don't have any permission. So Flickr does a nice job of sharing those licenses on every image. Um, other websites, you may have to dig a little deeper. It's not uncommon for um, licenses to be located near the photos, specifically on photo sharing sites. But if you can't find it at first glance, then that's where some deeper research is required. If you do have permission, we also have to fulfill the second criteria or attribution. So how do we give credit? Here's an image of an iPad on Flickr that I happened to take. This is one way to give attribution or credit. It's just to put the URL of the photo underneath of the image itself, maybe on the slide or on the, the frame of the video that you're producing. I feel that this is fine for elementary age students. There's no formal citation um, really necessary or required. Um, it's just the matter that you are giving credit. So putting a link directly below the, the image, even in small, small type, is at least a good first step. If we want to do the gold medal standard of giving attribution, consider the acronym TASL. If you include in your attribution the title of the piece of media, the author, the creator, the source, where it was found, on what website it was found on, and then of course the specific license, you will definitely cover everything um, necessary for this attribution. Here's an example for the image we saw on the last slide. The title is Writing Tools. The author is Katie Morrow. It was found on Flickr and it's licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. You can choose. These at, uh, giving credit, these attributions, can be placed directly with the images or media, but they can also be collected and put at the end of the presentation or the end of the movie. And that's fine as well. What's most important is that you have the attribution somewhere. So we know that we have to have permission and give attribution. So how can we find things that are safer for us to use in education? Um, I have some favorites sites for finding music and images and videos that I want to share with you that I use in my classroom and recommend to teachers. These are by no means an exhaustive list. They're just a good starting place. Um, and hopefully just using one or two of these will lead to better copyright practices for all of us. So let's start with images. Usually the first place people go to to find images is just doing a simple Google image search. If you're willing to take two more seconds and do two more clicks, we can be a lot more conscientious of copyright. So here I'm going to again search for an iPad, an image of an iPad on Google Images, and it comes up with all kinds of results. And if I were to just take an image from these results right now, I would be negligent. But if I click on search tools and expand that drop down menu, you'll see that there is an option here for usage rights. If I change this to any of the usage rights other than the not filtered by license, then we're going to get a more representative sample because Google now is actually looking for those CC licenses, those licensing on the images to know that, to alert us that it's okay to reuse them. So I do have a smaller subset of images now, but I still have a great amount of choices to choose from. Um, when I do choose the image that I want to use from the search results here, then I would need to go ahead and view that image on the page where it was hosted, 
um, unless I can see the creator um, right from this, this metadata in right here. So depending on the site that the photo is coming from, it might also take another click to go visit the page and find the image there in order to give the attribution that, that is necessary. So definitely encourage your students that at the bare minimum, they need to click on that search tools and click on that drop down menu for labeled for reuse or the, the different ways to uh, sort or filter the list, the usage rights, in order to get more safe use of media, at least as far as images. Another website that you cannot go wrong on is photosforclass.com. I believe they also have another version called photosforwork.com. Both of them are searching only Creative Commons licensed photos, specifically to be able to use and reuse in an educational setting. Now the reason why I really like this site is that it automatically puts the attribution on any photo or image that people download. So once again, we're going to search for an image of an iPad. And you might find that the number of photos in the Photos for Class um, library are fewer than doing a Google image search, but I do believe that they're safer. And this is a great site for elementary age students because the citations are already on the photos. So now if I choose this image here, I can say download. And when I open that image up and get ready to put it into my project, you'll notice that right along the bottom edge is a footer giving that tassel, all that information for the attribution. Very complete, very automatic, and it's across the board, 100% of the image is there. So again, it doesn't take a lot just to recommend to our students and ourselves that we use photos for class the next time we're looking for an image for something we're sharing on beyond our own private learning environment. Another great site for images is called Pixabay. This is free images and videos you can use anywhere. Over 570,000 free photos, vectors, and illustrations. Um, I'm going to click on this site and give you one word of warning that makes this um, somewhat scary. And then when you search for an image, iPad for example, again, the first row comes up as sponsored images. Now if you are smart enough and train your students to do so as well, to ignore that first row, anything beyond that, you're good to go. Um, you can definitely tell that these are not the free images. If you just look a little bit on them, you'll notice they have the, the watermark on them, meaning this is something you need to pay for to use. Um, you do not have the rights to use it. It also labels everything else down below it as free images. But other than that, if you just you know learn to ignore that first row, this is a great site. Another strong resource for obtaining copyright-free images and clip art is openclipart.org. Specifically built for clip art, you can get icons, any kind of an image here, and use it completely free of worry. So here are my results for iPad, and you can see they're more cartoonish, more icon-like, but lots of images and choices to work with and a great resource for images. So let's switch gears into the area of audio and music. Now to create our own music, all we need is access to GarageBand, um, a free app for an iPad or built into the Mac. Um, and even a non-musically -music trained person can easily crank out a jingle or a little bit of background music for any media project with GarageBand. If we don't have access to that though, however, and we can still find music to use to enhance our projects um, without too much worry. Probably my favorite website for music is incompetech.com. These are um, royalty-free music selections posted by Kevin McLeod. And if you can do it through um, full search or view collections, 
in order to find different kinds of genres of music or feels or tempo. Um, so there's different ways to search the site. They also have some suggested pieces of music down below. Now, it does take some time, and I'll be honest with you, to find music on any of these sites because you have to listen to all of them to see if they're going to fit the mood of your uh, project. But on Incompetech, there's an easy to find listen button. And then directly above it, when you find the one you want, there's the download button. You can download it immediately without any kind of login. It's an MP3 so that you can add it to most projects. That's in Competech, a great place source for um, a lot of music without words, without a lot of lyrics in it. So it works great for background music for your videos and uh, other productions. Another one is called CC Mixter. Now this site, um, you can go to dig.ccmixter or just start at the ccmixter.org homepage. And they're telling you that you already have permission to use it. Because basically artists upload their music to this website in the hopes of getting exposed. Um, there's some other sites kind of like this too. Um, but they are definitely labeled as free music, um, even for a commercial project, which usually isn't the case in, in our schools but definitely is background music for film and video. Let's go ahead and just see what the search results look like here. Here again, the, the play button is very visible and easy to preview the sound. And then the download button's right next to it, giving us that music file that we can put into any PowerPoint, Keynote, presentation, an iMovie, whatever it might be. Archive.org is a website that has that hosts free books, movies, software, music, and more. Um, I'm recommending this one as a place to locate um, video clips. Um, it definitely is mo more like a museum and it hosts old files, um, old videos, maybe historical video clips or um, definitely nonprofit things. I am not for sure that you're gonna find everything you need here. And I also am not for sure that it won't be filtered at school. A lot of times archive.org is blocked by our local filters. However, um, most students and ourselves can go home and locate some media that we need for a project and then um, have access to it when we, when we get back underneath of our school's filters. And that's fine too. Um, here's your search bar and your access to media from within archive.org is pretty self-explanatory. If that doesn't work for you, there's a good one-stop shop site in search.creativecommons.org. Now, here if I search for iPad, I do have to choose kind of a subset or basically um, a site to search on. But it gives me a lot of choices, so I can try more than one, too. Um, it does have Flickr as one of its first um, sources of, of images. Um, it's got Google, of course, too, and Google Images. Gemendo is another music sharing site that I've used successfully in the past that has some copyright free music on it. Um, and then there is, um, or copyright friendly, I should say. Um, another one that's highly recommended is called Wikimedia Commons. And it's, it's also, uh, it has kind of like archive.org, it has photos, music, and video. Um, and on the, the home page here, you can see what kinds of hits it came up with. And you can do some additional search results there, too. But starting with search.creativecommons.org is a great starting place. And trying several of those sublinks out. And, um, and then, of course, remembering everything beyond that. But I have collected even more than what I've been able to share today into a URL or a Google Doc that I hope everyone can use um, and shorten the URL so it's easy to remember. So if you're, not, if you're feeling limited by these few options for finding copyright-friendly media, um, try tinyurl.com slash copyfriendly. And it's just an ongoing, easily updatable list of different sites that have Definitely um, copyright-friendly music, animation, and images 
Um, be careful because you might link from one or click on one and, and exit it and, and find stuff on them that isn't at first glance entirely um, appropriate or you know, acceptable for everyone to use, but for the most part, should give you lots of options for, for finding good stuff. And if that isn't enough, I've got some um, really high quality resources that I would recommend you take a few minutes to explore. There's a couple of blog posts from the Book Creator blog that specifically address using copyright licensing in your projects. Um, this one is on finding good quality images and it's just understanding the terminology. It's real straightforward and um, nice to give a good definitions of all those terms. And this one is top five sources according to the blog authors of finding images and photos. So they de definitely mention the Flickr Creative Commons. They mentioned Pixabay that we looked at. And their number three choice was Photos for Class. And they also have a number four and a number five. And you can see, well, we looked at Open Clip Art as well, but you can see it does give each one a rating and an explanation for why they chose it and why they ranked it the way they ranked it. So this is helpful too. Five sites for um, finding good images. Matt Miller from Ditch That Textbook has a good blog post on how to get and use free images the right way in class. A lot of this will be repeating, but it's a good review. There's free digital citizenship instructional resources from Common Sense Media, always available at this link. Now, this, these are great um, materials for teaching copyright and acceptable use to our students, for, for actually letting them practice the concepts and the, the important lessons learned. I particularly like the iBooks lessons. They have them for all the grade levels, so they have them for grades K through 2, grades 3 through 5, grades 6 through 8. <laughs> they're all free. And then grades 9 through 12, they're all free. You do have to have access to the iBooks app in order to read them. Um, if you don't have the ability to utilize iBooks, your students don't, then you could um, use Nearpod lessons from the same organization. However, these do cost. They do have interactives as well, which are pieces that they built into these lessons. Um, and you don't have to do the entire book, for example, or the entire Nearpod lesson. You can just find the chapter or the section on copyright, which is in almost every grade level of material. And it's just great high quality um, teaching resources. And finally, I did locate a YouTube video series from Discovery Learning that might be worth taking a look at too, with a series of videos discussing copyright for educators. So I tried to practice what I preach and give my credits here at the end. Um, this is just an example, but it is important and um, something that I know I need to be extremely conscientious of in, in all the work that I do. The first is that the, the slide presentation template I actually got. It was labeled for reuse by anybody um, and it was offered for free by Slides Carnival. So I left that link here, giving credit to them for the design of the slides. The photographs on the slides that came with them, and I only used a couple of them, but they are, um, they came with the template, and it, there is the, the attribution there. And then additional images that I added on slide one, I found the image of the broccoli on Pixabay, and it was public domain, CC0 license. So no attribution necessary. Now I just went so far as to be over conscious about it by listing that. Um, and the screenshots on slides 19 through 27, they came directly from each of those web tools' website. So I made the screenshots and, um, and obviously by going to their website you would see the same thing. On slide 12 there was also an image from, that came from Pixabay. You know, another thing that's great if you want to really reinforce the concept of providing credit and attribution to creators of media and content online is leaving the, the artist or the photographer a note or a comment when you do use something. So back to uh, my own personal Flickr photos, for example. 
when somebody leaves a comment saying, hey, I used your image, you know, here on this website or in this presentation, um, it's, it's really affirming, it's reaffirming. Um, it validates wanting um, artists putting things out there with Creative Commons licenses, and it also shows that people are um, responsibly practicing digital citizenship things. So it's a win-win for everybody. So that's all I have today. I hope that gets you at least a taste of what's important with copyright and acceptable use. It's definitely not meant to scare anyone away from using media found online in an educational setting. It just means we need to use a little more caution um, and definitely remember that it is good for us. It's good for um, intellectual property rights of, of all. It's, it's good for our students to see us modeling that and expecting it from them so that we don't arrive in any hot water down the road. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at katie at esu8.org. Um, and like I said earlier, we, we definitely hope to share more um, resources and support for digital citizenship practices, specifically on copyright and acceptable use in the very near future. Thanks so much.